Two minutes. Two minutes. One minute. Go live. I'll begin after one minute. You know, go live. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and it is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to the August gathering here. Our guest speaker, Shri K. Jayakumar, has traveled the length of the country from Kerala to be here today. Before I start uh, the formal introduction to the uh, talk, may I request Member Secretary Dr. Misra to please welcome our guest speaker. We are all so short. Chairman Intak and my dear friend Jay Kumar and all the audience today, it is my great pleasure to welcome Sri Jay Kumar to this uh, institution of ours. He is a person who is very erudite and not only a very famous person, but a personal friend of mine, a colleague, and uh, we have worked together in the Ministry of Culture and have spent much time gossiping, talking about our bosses and about many beautiful subjects such as what he's going to speak about today. I'm sure Manisha will tell you a lot about his achievements and all that he's done in life. In one lifetime, he's done so much, so she, she's going to tell you all about it. But suffice it to say that, to me, Mr. Jay Kumar is a great friend and an exceptional human being, a very beautiful human being. And for that, I am happy and grateful that he considers me his friend. And a translator. He has authored 45 books and writes poetry in both Malayalam and English. Presently, he is the president of the Poetry Society, India. And now, without much ado, I invite you, sir, to take this forward. Chairman of INDAC, Member Secretary uh, Chudan Mishra, Manisha, distinguished members of the audience and uh, friends. A few months ago, I gave a talk at IIC on the same topic, and I had invited my senior colleague and my well wisher. Dr. Mishra, to chair that session. I think she has masochist tendencies. <laughs> As if the torture on that day was sufficient. She wanted a repeat performance here. So this opportunity came to me to come to INTAC and uh, make that presentation. Frankly speaking, all the talking notes I had on that day is no more to be seen. I'm such an organized fellow. <laughs> on my computer, I did a lot of search. I don't know in what, uh, in which folder and in what pen drive it is there. But in the pen drive of the mind, I think something is left. 
So I had put down everything on uh, the computer for today's talk. So this is a freshly minted talk, <laughs> uh, 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 a pale adaptation of what we did in, uh, uh, in IIC. Intech has always been a very interesting and important place in my landscape. Not only you are uh, the secretary here, but when we were in the Ministry of Culture, we were together for a while. Intech was an oasis. What we could not do very well, Intech always does better. <laughs> so we, all, we always used to wonder where we goof up, Intech excels. So Intech has, Intech has been a source of great envy for us now that envy has turned into admiration. Now we are no longer part of government that envy has turned into admiration. And therefore, I feel extremely honored to stand before you in this very, in this uh, hall uh, of INDEC and to talk to you about a topic which I'm sure will hold us together for the next 40 minutes or 50 minutes, followed by a brief question answer. It has come out well, but as I, as I explore it, uh, one has as a, as a as an Indian driver, you know, we never keep to lanes. So <laughs> I have laid out the lanes, so I think I'll be a, an American driver who will always keep to the lanes. Anyway, so with this introduction, brief introduction, I will uh, go to the topic. This topic has uh, fascinated me for quite some time. Whenever you read, and, and I have approached this topic not as a spiritual seeker, not that I don't have any spirituality in my life, but I have approached this topic not to understand more about spirituality, but to understand more about spiritual poetry. So my flirtation with this, if I may use an inappropriate word of flirtation with these saints, is mostly <laughs> as, a, uh, as a student of literature, as a student of poetry. Why is this poetry so intense? What is the source of this intensity? It all started with my uh, fascination with poetry and the kind of poetry they write. Um, so in, in all the poetry of the spirit, in their spiritual quest and enlightenment, there is an element of quarrel with the orthodoxy, which always interested me. These people, they talk about uh, God, spirituality, spiritual truth, compassion, but when it comes to their interface with society, they are extremely intolerant and not intolerant. They, their, their voice becomes very strident. So this contradiction also has fascinated me as a student of literature. So when it comes to breaking with societal rituals, there is a great sense of freedom that they redeem in this life. Their poetry also uh, illuminates itself with this kind of great freedom, sense of freedom. Now, we find this very same sentiment not only among women uh, poets or women saints, but also in almost all the poets of the Bhakti movement. It is not exceptional only to women saints, but when it comes to women saints, there is some change, some differences. We find this tone in Tulsidas, in Nanak, in Tukaram, in Basavanna, in Namdev, in Kabir, in Jnaneshwar, in Chaitanya. They are otherwise very sober and very compassionate individuals, but when it comes to negating society and social norms, there is a, a streak of, there is a note of stridency in their, in their voice. And several poets of Bhakti movement also has this. All of them in their own inimitable styles fiercely question and even ridicule superstitions, meaningless rituals, image worship, priestly class, uh, caste differences, animal sacrifices, and such draws that accumulate in organized religions. Bhakti poets could never understand these things. They have to ridicule it. They have to get away from all these things because they are animated with another vision of reality. Therefore, all this is dross for them. The revolutionary aspect of the Bhakti movement that swept across the Indian subcontinent has as its foundation this idea and firm belief that direct communication between the worshipper and the divine is possible. You don't, have an in, you don't require an intermediary without any priestly intermediaries and the rituals, the intermediaries have specialized. God doesn't want this kind of rituals, but the intermediates, for them, it is a part of their survival. So it is unsurprising that all of them express themselves um, not in Sanskrit, but in the local dialects. No Bhakti movement uh, uh, poet has been particularly expressive in Sanskrit. They talk in Kannada, they talk in um, uh, Kashmiri. Uh, Kabir speaks uh, 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 Avad or whatever, you know, that 
uh, that local language, the, the dialects of the people, because they have to talk to the people and tell them that you are not poor stuff, ordinary stuff, uh, lower in the rank. You are direct descendants of God. Talk to him directly. So they want to first talk to them in their local di dialect and tell them, not wrapped in the mystery of Sanskrit, which was in any case forbidden to the ordinary people. Sanskrit was only to the Brahmins and the upper caste. So the subversion was, uh, was visible even in the choice of language. So it was subversive. So in later years, we hear this note of an unorthodox but intense relationship with the divine in the poetry of Tagore. That is how I, I got these doors open through the key that Tagore has provided me. I am an ardent, not only an admirer, but a translator, and I consider myself, I was telling Mandira Ghosh, I am a self-appointed uh, Tagore scholar. Although nobody, nobody recognizes me as a Tagore scholar because I was not born in Kolkata. But, but uh, being born in anywhere in the world, is not a disqualification to understand Tagore. So these famous lines from Gitanjali actually crystallizes the sentiment. Although Gitanjali talks about so many other things, the famous lines like leave this singing and chanting and telling of beats, whom does the worship in the lonely dark corner of a temple with doors all shut. It is actually blasphemous in a way, in a purely religious way it is blasphemous. For the priestly class who has to go to the temple and do the rituals, Tagore is asking, whom does the worship in the lonely dark corner of a temple with doors all shut? There is a squint in his eyes. There is a glint in his eyes, isn't it, when he says, Aap kya karta hai dar? <laughs> with doors all shut, so that nothing comes inside, you know. So I was fascinated. Again, yesterday while I was writing this, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. The kind of, the curiosity or the, 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 the kind of, you know, uh, he's very curious. Who are you worshipping in this darkness? So leave this singing and chanting and telling of beats. Bhakti movement has said this. Leave all this and directly you, you make a direct call to God. That is it. So these lines contain the quintessential rebellion of the Bhakti poetry. I know I'm not talking about Bhakti poetry at length. And this kind of, uh, 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 this kind of rebellion is understandable. Because once they had the experiential illumination of oneness and reality, oneness and reality the abiding mystic, that abiding mystic experience lends a sense of authenticity. It gives a sense of authenticity that makes their voice shrill and sharp. They cannot be otherwise. It is but natural that external frills and hollow rituals have no appeal to them because they have already tasted the nectar directly. Then why do you want to go for these fake commodities? That is the question. However, when it comes to women saints and poets, I don't have much time in any case, isn't it? We are already at 4.45. However, when it comes to women saints and poets, so I will read, this discord is further amplified. There is already a discord in bhakti poetry. Of course, Lalita and all the predates, uh, the poets I'm talking about predates bhakti. They were precursors of bhakti movement. They, are, they cannot be included in the conventional bhakti movement, but the spirit and sentiment is the same. When it comes to women saints and poets, this discord is further amplified. Though the essential impulse of this quarrel with the status quo is the mystic truth, its intensity and certitude, the angle of divergence from the socially accepted norms of conduct and ideas is far more pronounced and provocative in case of women than in the case of men's saints. The angle of divergence is very high. Men also diverge, men's saints also diverge, but it is far more contained and far more, uh, you know, it's not so pronounced. Uh, they wouldn't mind if I have to obey it, okay, I will obey it. But whereas when it comes to a woman said, no compromise. She is uncompromising because she has already seen a different truth. There is no compromise for social etiquette and social nicety, nothing. It is curious to observe that while spiritually enlightened male gurus and saints do not necessarily, there are renouncers, there are renunciants, but they do not necessarily renounce their identity of the householder. There had been householder uh, uh, Maybe few of them we know, but there are so many unknown or little known people, little known outside their uh, area. So there are, women are still enlight getting enlightened and pe women are still suffering. Only thing is they, we, we do not know them at a national level. Those who had left their ideas, of, ideas in their voices are better known as we have proof of their thinking. That is what I am saying. Women keep on suffering, but those who have managed to put it in writing, not in writing, in, in dialects, in verses, in uh, walks and vajanas as they are, they are called, we know, we have some insight into their, uh, into, the, into the kind of suffering they have undergone. 
So the focus of this talk, we'll come to the second point, that is, in today's talk, we will not talk about all the women, since there are so many, and in one hour or 50 minutes, we may not be able to condense them. Therefore, I have uh, chosen three, uh, not three people, but firstly, one category is the, it is very seldom spoken, that is, the women uh, adherents of Buddha, the uh, Buddhist bhikshunis, uh, Buddhist women, Called a, their, their poetry is contained in the book called the Theri Gatha. Then I'll talk. That I'll talk about first because they they are in the first century BC and all that. Then we talk about Lal Dead, and then Akka Akka Mahadevi of Karnataka. Although Akka a preceded Lal Lal Dead, first I'll talk about Lal Dead and then go to Akka Mahadevi. Akka is 12th century and Lal Dead is in 14th century. But I have more information about, or rather, I spend more time on Lal Dead. Therefore, I'll talk at that then. What is, common, what is the common thread that passes through all of them? Before we dwell a little more on each of them, there are certain key common elements among these people. Firstly, they have crossed the social Lakshman Rekha. They don't care a hoot about social Lakshman Rekha. Secondly, they are happy about where they are. They don't regret. Regret is the last emotion they experience. They are happy what they have done and what, where they are, and they are happy that they have what they have renounced because they have no value for what they have renounced. And that is why they could renounce. Had they got any value for marital relationship, social uh, status, uh, or family uh, comfort, they don't care, uh, care a dime for that. So they are very happy that I have renounced. I have, con I have become myself. Thirdly, they have no difficulty in integrating the essential aspects of any religion. But they are not bound by any particular religion. Even if we call Akka Mahadevi, um, uh, this, uh, what, what is it, Veera Shaivism or uh, Lal Dead as Kashmiri Shaivism, these are all uh, nomenclature with only limited application, I would say. They are not conventional uh, Shaivite or conventional, uh, uh, this uh, Linga, not Linga, what is it, uh, that kind of Shaivism, Veera Shaivism. That is all subsequent scholarship which is trying to put them in these cages, you know, a cage, cages which they have tried to break. So, fourth, uh, is that their words strike a deeper chord among the ordinary people while the scholars find them problematic. They have no problem with ordinary people. It is the scholars who have a problem with them. And finally, for them, God is an immanent presence, immanent presence everywhere and not an idol or a shrine. Please do not tell me that God is in this shrine, God is in this idol. They also must have caused, spoken about Shiva and Mallikarjuna and all that, but then it is not that particular idol or that particular deity. It is a concept. It is a concept. So now I'll talk to you about Theri Gathas, that is the Buddhist women's literature, which is not, I don't find much literature also on this, but luckily I got a few books. That is how I claim to uh, know about these things. The Theri Gatha is the, but it is a very interesting book, very fascinating book. The boldest utterances by any woman in the world, I should say, two million uh, millennia ago, in the time of Buddha, in the time of Buddha, 2,500 years ago, the Theri Gatha is the anthology of poems compiled, composed by the first ordained Buddhist women, Buddhist women monks. The name Theri only means a senior woman, like Didi and, you know, uh, Theri. The poems contain the experiences of these women, some of whom attained Nirvana, where we talk about the realization of truth in Hindu terminology, in the Buddhist terminology, it is Nirvana. Nirvana, as they call in Pali, basically Nirvana as we understand it, even while the Buddha was still alive. They call these poems Udanas, that means inspired utterances. Theri Gatha is considered as the first collection of women literature anywhere in the world. Sankha, Buddham Sharanam Gachami, Dharmam Sharanam Gachami, Sankham Sharanam Gachami. Sankha is a basic tenet of Buddhism. Those who joined the order have to necessarily leave their homes. So joining Sangha invariably implies that you leave your home. It is said that the Buddha was not initially very much in favor of admitting women to the Sangha for purely practical reasons. At the same time, Buddha had no doubt that women can achieve the highest level of Nirvana. That also he knew. But subsequently, it is his mother, sister, who pleaded with him, saying that you should not keep women out of your Sangha, admit them. 
So these are all documented. So that is how Buddha said, okay, they can also join our, uh, our fold. So Nirvana here has to be understood as a complete liberation from samsara. The women in the Theri Gatha express the joy at their achieving Nirvana and many of them recount with detachment and even jubilation the trials and tribulations that preceded it. That, that now they are in a frame of mind where it has become big tamasha to talk about the earlier times when we had, uh, uh, had uh, pursued pleasures or men wanted us to, to be with them, all these things, you know. So the, one of the typical verses is this. I saw my experiences as if they were not mine. Born from a cause destined to disappear, I got rid of all that fouls the heart. I am now cool and free. All that fouls the heart. That is the expression for all the sensual pleasures of the world. The operative phrase is to get rid of all, the, all that fouls the heart. They refer to human desires and action that perpetuate suffering, ignorance, anger and passion. This poem celebrates individual transformation that ends in liberation. After the liberation, these women enjoy equality among themselves. Before liberation, they had suffered social inequalities. Theories also invalidate the Brahminical notion that women are incapable of such knowledge and wisdom. Chanda, one of the theories, says in one verse, in the past I was poor, a widow, without children, without friends or relatives. I wandered for seven years, tormented by cold and heat. Then I saw a nun. I said, make me go for this. Buddhism offered that reassurance to women and encouraged their power of self-determination. In that liberated frame of mind, Buddhist women, fully aware of the fleeting pleasures of life and the impermanence of life, embraced the life of Dharma and lived fearlessly thereafter. Now coming to Laldet of the 14th century Kashmir, we discover that the plight of women had not undergone much radical change since the days of Theri Gatha, composed nearly two, two million, one and a half millennia ago. The women, plight of women continues to be the same even in 14th century compared to the first century of the Buddhists. Though the biographical details of this of Laldet are rather sketchy, she is the most influential persona whose sayings and verses have permeated the consciousness of Kashmir. Her utterances known as Vak have entered the day-to-day -day discourse of a, of a people as shared wisdom. She is claimed by both Hindus and Muslims, though she is beyond both the religions, as she represents a different syncretic view of life, of reality. There are elements of Kashmiri Shaivism as well as Sufism in her sayings. But she is neither, I would say, she is neither a Shaivite nor a Sufi. She is lal dead. She is lal dead. What are known about her life are elementary. She was born into a Brahmin family, was married at the age of 12, and she had a troubled domestic life. The mother-in-law has been particularly cruel to her and the husband suspicious. There is a story that mother-in-law always used to hide stone uh, under the rice bowl, rice that was given to her, you know, and pretending, oh, she's eating so much, underneath it is a stone. So all kinds of stories are there. And uh, in some of the poems, she has also uh, sort of validated those assumptions. The mother-in-law has been suspicious. Her spiritual orientation and engagement with the divine was always misunderstood. The husband thought that where is she she going early in the morning in the name of meditation, so he followed. And there are all kinds of stories about her life. However, at the age of 26, Lalla said enough is enough. She renounced the household and became a disciple of a Shaiva saint, Siddha Srikandha. After completing her training for nearly 10 years at the Guru's house, she began the life of a wandering saint, a mendicant. This also suggests that she has discarded her identity um, uh, it is said that when she was asked if she doesn't feel any shame to appear naked before men, uh, in the sense she, she, it is said that she walked naked, that like it is said of many saints, it is also said Laldet was unclothed. Maybe it is metaphorical, we really don't know. But then there is a poem in which she is asked, don't you feel shame, uh, ashamed to walk naked among men like this? It is said that when she was asked if she doesn't feel any shame to appear naked before men, she asked in return, was, is there a man around? 
Is there a man around? That is what she asked. There is a similar story about Meera also. She asked the same question because there is only one man and that was Krishna. Here also he says there is only one man and everything else is Prakriti, uh, his, his creations. Or, because she doesn't recognize any social man as a man. So maybe this notion of nakedness became popular from her own verse. The Guru gave me one word of wisdom. She says, go from inside within. Go within from outside. For Lala, uh, that is the surest prophecy and this is why I dance in naked abandon. Maybe the nakedness is the nakedness of the soul. Maybe we don't know. In any case, that doesn't appeal to us. Her words are deeply personal and refers to herself in first person in these walks. That has been a major reason for her walk or her verses to appeal to generations at a personal level. Because she talks about herself, how I endured this. She takes the ordinary person on an individual journey through suffering, disillusionment, anguish, anguish to search and ultimately the realization. People who are in different stages of life could identify with her suffering when she says that I have undergone this. And that is the highest truth that liberates. This movement from the outer to the inner world is also a movement away from, away from negative emotions like greed, anger, pride and fear. Her words are at once profound and personal. That is why they have survived for six centuries as collective memory, as songs, proverbs and aphorisms. The most spectacular aspect of her life is the realization of pure consciousness, Shiva. Shiva is pure consciousness. It is not the idol that we worship, but it is pure consciousness, which gives her deep conviction and courage and authenticity. She says, like gold when burnished loses all impurities. Like gold when burnished loses all impurities. I glowed in the fire of pure consciousness, melting in love. I found the fog of delu delusions lift. I found the fog of delusions lift as the sun rose right beside me and Lal bloomed like a lotus in the mud. Lal bloomed like a lotus in the mud. In that stage, there are no differences and discriminations. No need for ritual, no need for shrines, no caste, nothing. Why? Then she asked the priestly class, why smear ash and perfume paste on yourself? Why are you putting all these things? Be just the way you are. Bear God in your heart. And that's all it takes. Saral, Saral and Sahaj, these are the two words normally used when you talk about uh, Laldet. Saral and Sahaj. Simplicity and your originality. Your, that is your be. You be what you are. The faith in oneself and one's worth as the instrument of the Supreme Being is the greatest reassurance to any individual. That is the significance, social significance of Laldet and such saints. Because it gives supreme reassurance to you that what I have accessed, you can also access. You only have to take the right course, that is all. Don't wander here and there. That idea of syncretic egalitarianism was a subversive counterculture. That was a counterculture and that is what invited scorn, abuse and adversity from orthodox proponents of religion. And there are so many points where she says they spit on me, they whiplashed me. I don't care because I don't care about this body. I have my, I know what I am doing. That kind of, I don't care about what you can do, whatever you want. I do, don't care. That kind of, uh, that kind of indifference is beautiful. Uh, in fact, you, you get, uh, you get uh, uh, sort of inspired by that kind of uh, tenacity. You do what you want. I know what I want. That kind of. Akamaha Devi, when, when we come to Akamaha Devi, she preceded Laldet by a fourth century. She was a 12th century saint born in Karnataka in the village called Shivamoga. Shiva, is, Shiva, Shiva is worshipped this in the form of Mallikarjuna. Mallikarjuna. Uh, that was her form of devotion. She, was betrothed, she betrothed herself to Mallikarjuna very early in her life. But she had to yield to domestic pressure and marry a local chieftain or a king, a Kaushika, the chieftain of the land. Of course, it was a very unfulfilling marriage for both. I'm sure Kaushika also must have been extremely bored with her because she had no interest in him. She says, I'm not yours. I belong to Mallika Arjuna. You have sort of snatched me, that kind of feeling. So if a wife keeps on giving that kind of impression, I also feel pity for this Kaushika guy because 
as a man i should empathize with him also you know so it was a very unsatisfying uh, marriage and uh, she considered herself as a wife to only one uh, one uh, source that is that is mallikar her lord was mallikarjuna nobody else she too had to leave her home towards homelessness it was natural it was predetermined predestined that she had to leave and she had to undergo a lot of suffering and she had to uh, give away all that she possessed including it is said that the husband said if you are if you don't want anything from me the costumes that the, the, the cloth that you wear is also mine leave it she said who cares you leave it so she leaves she abandons it covers herself with a very sumptuous dress uh, dresses she had this hair and she walked naked in society that is the throwing away all that she owed to her husband including her attire she is believed to have walked naked out of her house and of course uh, uh, and of course being defined and fearless she wandered and after great suffering and earning for her beloved she conveyed her feelings in poetic utterances called vachanas she took lot of time to to regain that inner composure there was a phase where she was totally restless she wanted she was earning for that union with mallika arjuna she did know what what exactly is her problem you know so finally that that dawns upon her that inner consciousness is what mallika arjuna is all about that is where she utters her vachanas this vachanas is even today very popular in karnataka basavanna was her elderly was a senior uh, senior colleague uh, if, if i may say so in karnataka ek ramanujam the famous poet and intellectual who translated some of the shaiva poetry including basavanna's poetry uh, i think some 30 40 years ago i could not resist quoting one last uh, quote from him about uh, when he says she struggled this is a very crucial word, uh, sentence she struggled as a body she struggled as a body as a woman as a social being tyrannized by social roles as a human confined to a place and a time her suffering was multi layered as a woman she suffered as a social being she suffered as a uh, as a human she suffered her body suffered so multiple layers of suffering through these shackles but she burst out of all these shackles defined in her quest for ecstasy and fulfillment a brief vachanam vachana poem that represents her thirst is like this and the tone is very important who who cares that is the refrain who cares who strips a tree of leaf of who strips a tree of leaves once the fruit is plucked once the fruit is plucked people will uh, pay, uh, will will trim the tree of, the tree of leaves who cares who strips a tree of leaf once the fruit is plucked who cares who lives with the woman you have left who cares who plows the land you have abandoned after this body was shown to my lord by my uh, was known by my lord after this body was known by my lord who cares if it feeds a dog or soaks up water once my lord has known me in utter fulfillment what is his body about it can be eaten by a dog or it can uh, sort of putrefy i don't care i don't care about this part this kind of abandon this kind of abandon single focused this unifying with my lord this realization of consciousness is the be all and end all of my existence that gives them utter courage now let us look at the pattern there is a pattern in the spiritual life and quest of quest for these women poets poet saints as could be seen from the life and utterances of lalde and akka and the buddhist women if we if we may sort of plot their life it has four stages i should say one of course is the household past the past sense of the life of a householder full of sufferings full of uh, uh, full of tragedy then the misfit stage where you cannot endure it any longer the misfit that angle of divergence becomes larger and larger she cannot survive in this household for long so the misfit stage phase and then comes the break then comes the break one day she just they just leave the house after a little bit of preparation probably once the break happens little bit of trouble and struggle and then 
they are on the long road to freedom. Freedom unalloyed, unbothered by anyone, and that is the final stage. But then there is a lot of preparatory stages. The household stage, the struggle, the misfit, the break, the exit, and the long road to freedom. So this pattern repeats with little bit of differences in all the uh, women saints or women uh, women who are on the spiritual path. Patmasana or whatever it is and holding your breath, you see, do all these things, but it will not take you anywhere. So the kind of disdain and, and, and kind of ridicule is embedded in these voices. So this is, this is representative, this kind of uh, uh, attitude. Now what accounts for this audacity? We have seen sufficient. Now I am into the, into the final phase of my talk. What accounts for this? Why have they become so strident like this? Why can't be slightly more accommodative, if I may ask? After all, people are ignorant. Forgive them. No. One is spirit, one one root. These, these are, there are several roots holding them to this kind of audacity. One is that they are very deep spiritual conviction. Not that others are not spiritually convinced, but this is hard-earned spiritual conviction, and they know that this is the truth, and nothing else but this is the truth. They have understood. They have got it. They realized it, they experienced it after so much, giving so much of price through their own body and through their own lives. It did not come to her, come to them naturally just sitting under a tree or something or in a dream. No, they had to undergo a lot of torture in this path and that, realize, that realization which came to them after so much of torture and so much of price that they have given is so valuable to them and they believe it 100%. They know that this is the only truth. Anything else is falsehood or illusions. That, that gives them vehemence. Why are you wasting your time pursuing shadows? That is it. It is that vehemence. And they are confident of their path. There is only this path. You may wander here and there. Ultimately, this path alone is the truth. Then triumph for body consciousness. That is the most important. They triumph over their body consciousness. They realize that it is this body, it is this body that has been creating kind of dissonance with the society. They have certain expectations out of this body. My role as a woman. The body is treated as impure sometimes. The womanhood itself is a liability for them. So I have to overcome this. And overcoming the body consciousness of a woman is not easy. The kind of price that they have given the kind of negotiation they must have done internally to overcome the fact that I am a woman and they become neither man nor woman. I am, I am his. That kind of, you should, we should empathize with them when women were scorned that you can never become an enlightened person because after all you are a woman with no brain, nothing, you know. Women are supposed to be in the kitchen. Women are not supposed to give birth to babies and take, look after them. So this must have been day and night, day and night drilled into them. But you don't believe it. You don't believe it. You have a different calling. And to overcome this womanhood, womanness, must have been a very, very, it must have extracted a great price out of them. So this triumph over body consciousness gives them so much of power because they have given in so much. I, that they earned them at a great price and this gives them total audacity. They can face anything if they have negotiated this. What else is more? I was born a woman, but I have overgrown this body consciousness. Triumph over body consciousness is, is the greatest root of their audacity because that is natural to them. It is biological to them. But then triumph over that is a great triumph. It's a great triumph. That is why they walk naked, as they say. Whether they have walked naked or not, we don't know. But they can afford. They can afford. They don't care. So that kind of thing is this triumph over body consciousness is a great source of their, of their strength. Then all, they are at the same time, there is a contradiction in what I'm going to say. Although they have triumphed over their body consciousness of a woman, there are certain biological instincts in a woman the mother instinct. The mother instinct may not be fulfilled, but the mother instinct is also something which makes a woman a far more valued member of our species than men. Because there are the biological function of a woman, of a, ma of a mother, also implies so many other attendant 
feelings a woman is a woman alone is capable of that that mother instinct also conveyed in these bhajanas and works must have taken although i said they are very strident in their criticism of orthodoxy but in giving reassurance to women or to men or to people to follow this path they are so considerate and they are so affectionate and like a mother is affectionate to their children you learn this that kind of affectionate intimacy also exudes in their audacity it is that mother instinct also that gives they can they can scold you they can uh, uh, they can uh, sort of you know castigate you all kinds of thing a mother can do lot of things not today there are rules but at the same time at the same time that motherhood that motherliness gives a kind of uh, kind of lot of affection to somebody who comes in search of knowledge when you convey it with your power you have overcome all that but that mother instinct is still in you and that gets conveyed even if, even when you are harsh even when you are harsh a man cannot convey that kind of that kind of sentiment in uh, chastising you in saying that this is the path when a man says it becomes very uh, it doesn't have this kind of beauty or which a woman uh, alone can convey now that is the that is the uh, one element which makes her her audacity that explains her audacity then uh, the, the another point is no that also takes you to the next point the roots of her audacity is that she has no ill feeling towards anyone even to her tormentors no women saint in any of these poems say that i shall take revenge on him or he was such a fool who did it she is able to forgive because they are in absolute ignorance there is no ill will to the tormentors they can talk as if it has done to, as as the buddhist uh, uh, woman says as if it has happened to someone else they have detached themselves with that forgiven them he, he, they have no in, uh, ill will towards tormentors and all these things give them utter fearlessness utter fearlessness because once their body consciousness is not there and once this great compassion is there fear is a monster who cannot attack them this utter fearlessness i don't think any man ha has been so much a fearless than uh, as fearless as women so it is this kind of this combination of these factors which account for the great audacity that we find spiritual audacity that we find in people like lal dead or buddhist theories or akamaha devi or mirabai all these people i think this is a, 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 a sort of pattern that we can discern in the audacity of this these great saints one final note before i conclude is that is this topic i was just i am i am forced to contemplate as a poet is this topic itself the construct of a male mindset <laughs> implying that women ought not have this kind of audacity i don't know i leave it for you to decide and chastise me if it is a male uh, it's a male uh, dominated or male directed mindset once i wrote all these things it occurred to me naturally why should i talk at talk about a topic like this as if they have no right to be audacious is it a male or patriarchal kind of mindset i really don't know but all the facts that i have said may be seen without the kind of uh, you know uh, no prejudices are involved while concluding this i thought this is one point on which i should conclude whether you find this construct of a male mindset maybe or may not be so this is what the gist of what i had to tell you about the roots of spiritual audacity of the women saints of india that leaves us another 10 minutes for interaction thank you very much ladies and gentlemen uh, sir will take questions if you have any but please do keep your questions brief no observations just come to the question straight away I have to uh, counter you a little please. bit, please. Um, um, there were four points. Now let me recall. One is uh, you're um, saying that women have to leave the home and matter. That's a given. 
At that I, time. Sorry? At that time, not today. Uh, I, Few uh, centuries ago. Uh, I would, uh, I'm sorry, I can't give exactly uh, what, but uh, the conversations that Adi Shankaracharya recorded with this lady who did follow him, but she was. That is the wife of the. Yeah. So, uh, and then in Tripura Rahasya, the, uh, there's a queen who was enlightened. So there, there, there are, are records there are, there of people records. who've, uh, within the, uh, they don't, that, that it's a given that they have to leave marriage and leave the home yeah, is uh, generally something. Generally talking I about the social norm that prevailed, you know. In ordinary, of course, in a scholar's house, it could be different. In a king's house, it could be different. But for the ordinary lay people, a woman is born, gives, given off at marriage in 12, 12 year or 30 years, and she delivers children. That's a normal thing. But of course, there are deviations. Even there are, Adi Shangara had a sort of lot of great exchanges with the wife of, I forget the name. Huh. Mandana Mishra's wife, yeah. No, no, that is fine. But I'm talking about the prevailing old yeah. traditional. Three more points, but I'll give other people. Thank you for your such a wonderful talk, which is very, very, I must say, a very courageous talk, I should say, define it. Because it is in a public space, generally people don't talk about all these things which you have uttered, and it should, should have been discussed in very much by someone who is a very sensitive poet, like you, who has understood the feelings of women. My question to you is, sir, that uh, what was the aim of Lal Dev Akka Mahadevi Andal. They wanted to become mystic, poet, householder, or they wanted to live. If so, what was the society was so unbearable to them that they had to, as you said, unbearable society made them. But as a poet, how do you read their poems? So, Lal, Lal Dev, that all these people, all these saints, have relevance even today. Because we are also. Ignorant people, like uh, Matthew Arnold would say, that ignorant army is clashing by night. <laughs> we are also lured by consumerism, and we think that uh, two flats in uh, Gurgaon will make us uh, very contented people. An Audi car in my garage will make me very happy. And we, are, we have our own illusions. Like people of ancient times had their own illusions about uh, your glorification. Even today, we are in the same boat. We are deluded by different illusions, that is all. But illus illusions still there are. People who understand that these are all passing fancies, why do you want to waste your life only in the pursuit of these things? That is what. And also in the name of religion, lot of superstitions, lot of petty rituals. So somebody who is enlightened would find all these things absolutely ridiculous. And uh, with, the, with their noble intention, they would like a, any number, as many people as possible to understand this truth which is very simple and lead a life of purity, inner purity, by which the whole society will be much better rather than, you see, all the feuds, all the fights, all the quarrels, all the killings, all the competition. Why, why is it? It's all, it all arises out of ignorance, isn't it? Ignorance and your attachment for wealth, your fame, your woman, your positions. Your so even today, even today, Lal Dead and others are relevant. Only thing is, we have put them in the uh, wonderful box of a textbook and, you know, very worshipfully we'll talk about them, but we will not, uh, we will not practice even one tenet of what they say. In fact, I will tell you a very interesting anecdote. Recently, I went to talk to uh, <coughs> a sannyasi in the sense he was a great sage of Kerala. So the person who was, I went to give a keynote address or whatever, and the person who was giving the welcome address expanded and said that uh, many people like him have been given, uh, their birthdays have been celebrated as holidays, you know, <laughs> the holiday have been declared by the government and such and such buildings were named after such and such people but this particular guru has been ignored by governments after governments and therefore we should, so I, beyond a point I could not endure this. So. <laughs> So when I gave my reply, or when I started talking, I said, look, we are looking at this great saint from our point of view, from, our, from the 
from the citadel of our very very petty mind thinking that if only i could get a promotion i'll be very happy if i get an award i'll be happy likewise we want also our saint to be recognized by the government issue a jeevo a government order by which his birthday will be a holiday very good i said do you think that really he wanted all this does his soul if at all you believe in a soul relish the idea that we are saying that in go he did not get the rightful place he he came and said so many things we do not have time even to read one sentence of what he says and this particular sage that i am talking about he had written a book called veda adhigara nirupanam which says it's a critique of vedas in which he says through vedic authority he questions those who said that people of certain caste cannot read vedas women cannot read vedas so he says i will quote vedas themselves which entitle you to read these things so you are misinterpreting vedas and misguiding people so knowledge is for everyone now that is what he said i said we should be practicing this we should be practicing what he said without believing in caste and creed and all that that is his best memorial rather than erecting a one crore structure so somebody said don't worry in ernakulam we are uh, somebody is creating a building for one crore of rupees so his soul will be happy so we are trying to bring down these great minds to our levels of pettiness even today that is happening in this country and everywhere in the world we will not obey or try to understand even a treatment a, a portion of what these people have said lal dad i would say even today she is relevant even today she is relevant when we are anyway i don't want to get into controversial issues but when religion itself is becoming more and more ostentatious and ritualistic she says saral and sahaj saral and sahaj be yourself you will know it you will know the truth and in that truth live blissfully that is a society she has trimmed we will not we have no time for that we have no time for that so therefore the relevance of lal dad and all these saints is that uh, there is a perennial significance for this kind of heartfelt utterances of truth and, yeah, please lal dad was also a great voice of protest yeah it is it is Ah. that you can just tuck in whatever measurements you want i'm just a garment is i mean she said this of course with great sarcasm that am i just a garment that you can cut to whatever size and shape you want i'd like to ask a question sir and i think as you said it's very relevant even today yeah yeah please um you brought up the word syncretic in a couple of times right, when you were yeah. talking particularly about lal dad i think the value of your wonderful first of all the the lovely um, title which drew me here two days ago by mistake and then i came back for it the uh, roots of their spiritual audacity i think the audacity is also to reimagine what society should be like and therefore also how different traditions can be brought together and brought and the realization that we are interwoven in some way uh, spiritually so no, no. whether i i would i would ask you to go further with this no no of, of course i could have gone further because i read i did read up uh, lal dad quite a bit not just lal dad but no no i know in the kashmir point. shaivism and the valley the sing, lot of, but then i thought if i load too much yeah. i will not reach anywhere and will not be able to stop on time this <laughs> last question please uh good evening sir uh like you rightly pointed out in the discourse that uh, lal dad is claimed both by hindus and muslims muslims call her lala arifa uh, pandits call her lal dad so uh, the question that i have always had and uh, would like to address to you is why is it that at that point in time both religions castigate such saints and later on they're just trying their best to have these saints for themselves you know there is a lot of research on the muslim men trying to claim that later she converted hindus try to claim that no she did not why does this happen i am sure the, i am sure the orthodoxy of all the religions would have tried their best to sort of <laughs> uh, hide her or rather uh, obfuscate her but then she was taken over by popular in, in popular imagination the ordinary folks the ordinary people sort of internalized far more than the scholar and the critic and the religious 
uh, fanatics, they, the ordinary people, particularly women, had internalized glimpses of a truth that entered the discourse of their common day-to-day -day utterances in Kashmir. Then when they re realized that Lal Dead cannot be wiped off, that memory cannot be wiped out, then if she is so important, then she has to be mine. Then she has to be yours. So that kind of apportionment takes place because she is invincible. Had she been forgotten after her death, oh, she was one of those, no, nobody knows. Several people must have gone like, but because popular imagination took over, because it was so direct from heart to heart, she, uh, she spoke to the heart of the people. Even today, she is a force to reckon with in, the, in Kashmir, isn't it? That is it. Also the bowels. The ah, bowels. That is another area where I am writing a yeah, book about. Yeah, let's write about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, one of the great bowel exponents is living in Kerala, the Parvati bowel. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I know her very well. She's a great singer also. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> so, that was inspired by ah, was inspired by bowels. Rather, the other way, Tagore gave bowels the kind of acceptance and legitimacy and uh, uh, acceptance in the respectability, respectability. Bowels were not respected initially, you know. Uh, they were looked upon as, you know, riffraffs. <laughs> they, they also do everything to, uh, to claim to be riffraffs because they appear in everything. But it is Tagore who gave them great respectability. In fact, he enacted a drama where he himself uh, adorned the dress of, uh, of the bowel. Wow. So it, all these had, you know, all these had contributory effects in in redeeming bowels to the to the mainstream of Bengali culture. Today, bowels is a very respected, accepted, and celebrated form of music and dance. OK, thank you very thank much for your very kind and patient listening. Thank you, sir. We have a small token of appreciation for you. And uh, may I request member secretary and chairman, sir. Thank you, sir. May I request everybody to join us for a cup of tea?